What I love to do is introduce the right people to the right people, I assemble the smartest people I can think of or reach out to to carry that conversation, and that's exactly what I've done today. Please give my panel a round of applause. Welcome. Okay, guys, Jay Martin here, CEO of Cambridge House, and I'm now joined by Michael Gayad. Uh, money manager, fund manager. He produces the lead lag report, among several other things. Michael, it's good to see you. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, no, my pleasure. Thank you. So there's a handful of things I want to talk to you about today and a variety of directions we'll probably end up going in the time that we have. But for anybody who's not familiar with you, could you start by giving us the elevator pitch, you know, what you do, what you spend your time doing? Sure, sure. So for the um, better part of the last 10 years, I've tried to build a bit of a name in the industry. I had a phase in my life when I was on CNBC and Bloomberg almost every other day. Hopefully that doesn't disqualify anybody watching this from continuing to watch it. Uh, was one of MarcoWatch.com's top writers for several years and, and built a fairly large uh, social media following along the way. I've got around 220,000 Twitter followers and 30,000 plus LinkedIn uh, first connections. I published since 2014 five different white papers over the years each of which has won a different award, uh, two from the Chartered Market Technicians Association, the Dow Award, and three from NAME, the National Association of Active Investment Managers, and have presented all over the United States talking about the findings of these award-winning papers, which relate directly to what is my primary profession, which is a mutual fund and ETF uh, manager. So I run the ATAC Rotation Mutual Fund, uh, and the ATAC US Rotation ECF, the ATACX, RORO, both of them are risk on, risk off strategies, which we'll get into. The papers document uh, this anomaly or kind of this, this idea that even though you may not know the exact mile marker that you might crash your car, you do know the conditions that favor an accident. Right? You know when it's raining to slow down, play risk off. When it's sunny to speed up, play risk on. And in the context of markets, there are leading indicators that more often than not tend to get ahead of these kind of extreme high risk periods. So everything that I do is much more focused around the idea that if you want to kill it, you have to not get killed. Right. And right. I think it's kind of a critical part about thinking about investing in general. I like that. Okay. Can you, so, so I want to pull on that. Give us a real life example, right? It's been a crazy year. So there must've been some indicators you've been watching. Uh, talk to us about what you've seen and what you did as a consequence, maybe dial it back 12 months. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's, um, it, it's been a remarkable period as we all know. So the, the mutual fund that I run goes risk on equities or risk off in treasuries using the behavior of utilities and treasuries as leading indicators to risk. So let me take a step back. The 2014 Dow award paper documents this phenomenon whereby historically, when you go back to the 1920s, when the utility sector, the most boring sector of the stock market, when utilities are outperforming the broader stock market on a very short-term basis, generally you tend to see stock market volatility rise afterwards with a lag. Right. right? So in other words, utilities typically move first performance-wise, and then the stock market tends to historically get more volatile. And one of the stats in the paper, for example, shows that uh, historically in the top 1% of VIX spikes, those real collapses in equities. Historically, utilities are already leading 75% of the time before the VIX spike takes place. Okay. Interesting. The conditions, right? Makes and sense. it's not it's not some random correlation. The causation there is around interest rates, right? Utilities are the most bond-like sector of the stock market. So as utilities move, it tells you something about changes in the demand for capital, changes in, uh, in, in inflation and growth expectations. Uh, treasuries have a similar dynamic. Historically, we have uh, long duration treasuries outperforming intermediate, a form of flattening. Uh, historically, when you have these kind of pulses of that, you tend to see a similar dynamic whereby stock market volatility, risk off conditions present themselves afterwards. So if you go with me on that, on that idea, and even if you don't believe me, you can go to the papers and see the actual research behind it. Mid-January last year, the mutual fund using utilities and treasuries picked up, up on their strength meaning that utilities and treasuries prior to the COVID crash were sensing something. There was some kind of expectation that the demand for money was about to fall. Mm -hmm. Fund positioned fully into treasuries, stayed there throughout the entire COVID crash, and then positioned back risk on March 31st into equity. So avoided the entire decline, made money during the flight safety trade, and then uh, positioned pretty much all in almost a week after the low, or pretty much a week after the low. So the mutual fund ended up being up over 72% just because it avoided a major tail event 
Again, yeah. not getting killed, right? Yeah. Made money, had higher capital compound off of, and then rotated back at lower levels. The challenge, Jay, as you know, is that you know, when you have an approach that's so focused on avoiding the accidents, you're going to be more cautious than most people and slow down continuously entering multiple storms. Sure. Which means that you're on average, more often than not, it looks like you're not getting to your destination fast enough because you keep slowing down and you keep being wrong, slowing down, waiting for the accident that never occurs until it finally does. Right. And right. last year was obviously that that accident. Okay. Okay. So I gotta ask. What are you watching right now, Michael? What indicators are top of mind? So look, the um, the area in the United States that most people have been focusing on are clearly small caps, right? Especially after the elections, U.S. small caps went vertical. And a lot of people thought that that was not justified because of zombie companies. And I don't disagree with any of those those narratives. But to some extent, a lot of the move that's happened in this post-election period, which is just a reiteration of the reflation trade, uh, is being justified by the behavior of lumber, in, in particular lumber relative to gold. So okay. one of the papers that won the uh, it won the 2015 Founders Award is titled "Lumber Worth Its Weight in Gold," and what the paper documents is another risk on risk off dynamic. Lumber is perhaps the most important commodity to track, more so than oil, more so than copper. I, mean, I know a lot of people look at oil for inflation expectations, valid. A lot of people look at copper for industrial pickup expectations, also valid. Lumber is more powerful from a signaling perspective, at least in the United States, because of the tie to housing. Right. So we know that the housing is a leading indicator of the economy. Most people's wealth is in their homes. The average home has about 16,000 board feet of lumber. So it stands to reason that if housing is a leading indicator, well, then lumber must be as well. When you compare it against gold, which is more of a safe haven risk off commodity, it actually tells you a lot about risk. Now, how does that tie into small caps and the justification of what we've seen higher? Well, if lumber is outperforming gold, that means there's an expectation of housing continuing, housing strength continuing. And we've seen that construction activity, which means credit creation continuing, right. which means U.S. consumer wealth increasing, yeah. which means small caps, which are more sensitive to the domestic economy, should be outpacing multinational large caps. Sure. Right, so there's a link there, right, between the behavior of lumber and even from a cap perspective, large versus small. So I, I keep watching this lumber to gold relationship very closely here, and that ties directly actually to the ETF I run, Roro, uh, from a risk on risk off perspective, because the relationship has gone vertical. Right? And it's more than just supply disruptions. Lumber has substantially outperformed gold. Right, that's risk on. That's in the, you can have these little wiggles in between, but clearly over the long, you know, since really the election, you've had this kind of unbelievable run. Uh, if that leading indicator gets to be too extreme, and maybe we're getting close to that, where it's vulnerable to mean reversion, mm -hmm. if the leading indicator starts reverting lower, that would be my my time to say, well, the conditions now might start to favor an accident in risk market in risk assets. And that's where uh, I think it can be quite ugly because the sentiment, I think, across the board now is so certain about the future in terms of the future being perfect mm -hmm. and this kind of uptrend. Sentiment-wise, I'd argue it's as strong as it was in the depths of the March collapse last year when everyone thought it was the end of the world. And that leads me to also kind of be cautious, right, in terms of managing expectations for how the rest of the year could play out. Because when you see sentiment so strong in one direction, you start thinking like, Contrarian, I suppose. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. And, and you know, look, I, I always make this point. I mean, Yogi Berra said it correctly, right? Predicting is hard, especially about the future. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, so I don't believe I'm, I, I don't tr make, try to make forecasts. I don't, I'm, what I'm trying to address is conditions where something is likely to happen, right? You've got a billion plus planets in the universe. As far as we can tell, there's only one where there's conditions to support life. Sure. Even this whole situation with GameStop, the conditions were there all along. Nobody knew exactly when it would hit. But sure. it suddenly hit. Yeah, right. right so right. conditions are everything, right? So, so for for me, you know, thinking about contrarianism, what it really means, it's not about betting against the crowd. It's about betting that the crowd can't predict the future no different than I can. Which mm -hmm. means that if you view it from that perspective, if everyone is betting on a certain future and believes they know that future, the payout by definition must be less because they're all betting on the same pot. Yeah. So I don't need to be able to predict the future. I just have to be able to anticipate where the pot is likely larger on the off chance that the crowd is wrong because nobody can predict the future. Mm -hmm. Right. So now what does that mean from an investment allocation perspective? Yeah. It probably means that a lot of what has gotten us here won't get us there. 
meaning that if everyone has been betting on stay-at-home stocks, tech stocks, uh, all these areas which have been incredible uh, movers post-COVID, yeah, independent of even the vaccine and and you know things kind of reopening, uh, maybe they start to revert too. Sure, probably. So where are people not looking right now that you are? So it's interesting, right? Because it seems like everything's going up except now treasuries, right? There, there's been a, a quite an aggressive sell-off. So the area which I think is is most interesting relates to the sort of broader macro style discussion of growth versus value, right? So, and let, let's kind of deconstruct that for a bit. When people talk about growth versus value, really what they're talking about is sector allocations, right? Growth tends to be more tech. Sure. Value tends to be more financials, more energy, more materials. Got it. Well, since the start of the year, energy, financials, materials which have been left for dead for a long time are suddenly at being like Lazarus. Yeah, and coming back. So, and and I tell you, I got to tell you, it's it's I I ranted on this a good example, the contrarian contrarian point. Uh, everyone last year was making the case that energy is is gone. Clean energy is going to take over the world. Okay, all that could be right. It does not be right next year or the year after. It can be a long process. You can have these kind of mini waves of strength as the energy sector tries to make a comeback. And energy has been one of the best performing sectors in the United States all year. Meanwhile, tech as a sector really hasn't actually performed. It's been in line with the S&P for the last four months, mm. right? So there is, I think, this kind of internal rotation going towards this value dynamic, favoring financials, favoring energy, favoring materials, which is really, at the end of the day, the true reflation trade, right? Because you'd expect financials would benefit from a steepening yield curve. You'd expect energy, oil would uh, recover because of inflation expectations, same deal with materials. Yeah. And those are areas which I think people are vastly under allocated because they're vastly over allocated to tech. You pop commodities in general in there? Yeah, I think, look, I, I, I largely agree with the notion that commodities are probably the cheapest asset class. Right. From a lot of perspectives, right? On a relative basis against equities. And it, just in terms of, sort of the Fed maybe getting its way in terms of jamming inflation into the system. Yeah. Um, and, and, and there's a lot more room for that to go. And, you know, it's interesting, right? Because I've made this case before. Commodities are what saved the Fed. Right? Because if you think about it, the Fed wants inflation because they created this debt monster. Okay. So how do you do that with the zero bound? Well, QE really doesn't do it. The only way you really get inflation is cost push inflation, which is commodity inflation. So if you're going to have some kind of a secular movement and maybe infrastructure spending is your catalyst for that, that will help the Fed out in terms of trying to jam that inflation into the system. Right. And I think that's still very early. Interesting. Okay. Okay, now, before we got on here, you had some interesting comments, actually, and, and you've been active over the weekend chatting about your thoughts on, on Bitcoin. Catch us up. So where do you sit right now, Michael? Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'm going to uh, set the record straight on this. Okay? And, <laughs> and I think this is really important. I'm not bearish Bitcoin. I'm not bearish crypto. Yeah. And you can say, well, crypto is not a thing because some of the maximalists will argue that. Okay, fine. I'm not bearish Bitcoin. You can be bullish longer term and you can be neutral or bearish short term. That's it. Part of the, the way people need to think about investing is you can be both bullish and bearish at the same time. It depends on your time frame I'm under which you're bullish. And I'll tell you that I myself am much more of a, uh, in terms of my own mentality, bearish on the system. I'm very bearish, on, very deflationist in my thinking because I think uh, fiat uh, economies often will get to this point where there's such an extreme uh, amount of leverage in the system that creates such a big gap in, in the difference between rich and poor that at some point society ends up breaking down. Right. Yeah. So I'm very much against the whole... Uh, fiat system as a as a as a as a way of kind of approaching the future. Now, having said that, I do believe that if you're going to be an investor and you're going to be bullish on something, you have to question everything. You have to debate everything. You have to take every single narrative that people use as bullish and counter it because that's what's going to help you with your own sizing and conviction. Yeah. So, you know. Let's, <laughs> It, uh, on uh, on Twitter, I was making this case that, well, Bitcoin's not really scarce. And I was making the case that, well, you know, okay, I understand it's a finite number, but if you can divide that finite number infinitely, and I understand that Satoshis are, are limited, well, then that by definition can't be scarce. And a lot of people started joking, saying, well, you don't know math, but it's actually factually true. The definition of scarce is something that is hard to get, meaning scarce implies illiquidity. Now, the illiquidity, liquidity aspect is kind of an important thing to kind of think through a little bit, just intellectually about where Bitcoin could be going, right? Because it's finite. 
but if you can divide it up into Satoshis and maybe if the protocol gets up, updated at some point, as some argue that it might, uh, maybe the Satoshis can be broken down even further, in which case you have this kind of infinitely growing supply of these units, right? Yeah. As yeah. the value itself increases. But that's, again, not scarce. It's a different word. I don't know what that word is, but scarce implies a liquidity. Now, look, again, liquidity is important because even from an investment standpoint, there's something you, I'm sure you've come across that's well known, that's known as the illiquidity premium, right? which relates to a lot of the way a lot of endowments tend to go about their own investing. right? Yeah. The argument basically is that if something is illiquid, there's added value to that. So there ends up being more alpha, more outperformance because you're investing in an illiquid asset. It's actually one of the reasons why uh, timber and lumber has, talk about independent signal, has always been an interesting asset class for some endowments to look at because it's largely uncorrelated and it's largely illiquid from that standpoint. So the definition of scarcity, if it relates to liquidity and illiquidity, does ha you have to kind of think about what does that imply for Bitcoin and what does that imply for a non-fiat based system. Um, so it wasn't sort of a bullish or bearish case, it was just a statement of fact. Right? Right. And I think that's important because again, if you're going to be an investor, you have to question every single bullish narrative, po poke holes at it, understand what you're buying and why. And that's what helps you with how much conviction to have with the amount of actual dollars you put in as a percentage of your portfolio. Right, right. Now, okay, so I wanna talk about sentiment a little bit because you know, I, I've seen some of your tweets. I see the response they get. I, I can also, like I entertain healthy debate. I encourage it. That's what this channel is for. And, you know, it's it reminds me somewhat of the gold market in 2010, 2011. I couldn't say anything, you know, even questionable about gold. I'd get my head taken off. It's like, how could, how dare you? You know, how could you possibly think the gold won't go up forever? Right? It's like, well, okay, come on now, guys. And there's somewhat similar sentiment in the Bitcoin ecosystem today, right? <clears throat> now, bubbles aren't created by the asset, they're created by the population, right? Sentiment, that's what drives it, right? So if I'm speaking, you know, with, with some criticism or questions about the Bitcoin price, I'm not talking about the asset, I'm talking about the sentiment, right? And, and the froth, that's what I'm talking about. So what are you seeing right now then? Because to your point, you can be long-term bullish and short-term bearish, and you're still bullish overall. Where do you stand today on Bitcoin when you look at the sentiments and the everything? You're hitting, you're hitting on something which I think is really, and I love that analogy because I remember that that when I used to be uh, one of Market Watch's most active and top writers, I, I knew I would get a tremendous amount of views if I just said gold or gold bug in an article. Sure, right? yeah. And to your point, right, there was such conviction. I've used that line on Twitter before on at Lee Lag Report that you know when when an investment becomes a religion, it's time to lose faith. Yeah. Now, the reason I say that is it's not about being bearish it's about the sentiment, to your point, because again, I go, I go back to nobody knows the future. I don't give a damn what anybody says. Nobody knows the future, right? And it takes humility to understand that, right? And I think to your point, look, to, I can see what I think you're alluding to, which is that there are these populist elements, right, in the way that Bitcoin has behaved, right? Yeah. I'm a CFA charter holder. I'm very proud of that hard work. Anybody that's known me or talked to me knows that I don't think like a CFA charter holder. The papers that I, I published since 2014 that I'm known for have uh, pretty much counter all notions of market efficiency. I run mutual, a mutual fund or an ETF that, that clearly is doing something which is against the idea of market efficiency, what's taught in the CFA curriculum. But because I had a CFA, uh, I have three letters after my name, a lot of people started going after me saying, oh, you, you don't know what you're talking about. But I was simply trying to be respectful and debating what terminology uh, should be a, assigned to the investment case for Bitcoin. And that applies not just to Bitcoin, to other investments as well. You can do the same thing to, with gold going back in time in 2010, 2011. So... It, Oftentimes, when you think about putting your money to work, it's less about the end point. It's less about the prediction. It's more about the path. Right? How you get there is what determines your likelihood of sticking to your investment right? from, from a just intellectual standpoint. 100%. And if sentiment is that one-sided, it could be right. But I go back to the other analogy, okay, what we just talked about. Well, if everyone believes that, then maybe the payout is higher, at least for a moment in time, on betting that the crowd is going to be wrong yeah. in being reminded that the future is unknowable, right? So, so that, that's where I come at it from, you know, and, and I get it, right? Every, every, every life altering technology will have its early adopters who are extremely uh, hardcore in the way that they view it. But when it gets to a point where you can't even have a discussion and 
the counter to something you're debating, which is not countering them, but countering a narrative, uh, when the counter is an insult, you know you're probably right, right? So, and I think this is sort of an important part that. about that, right? It really, it really, I really am sincere about that. And it's, and it's funny because it's like, you know, so even if you're going to argue, you know, that the whole world is going to be Bitcoin, everyone's going to adopt it. I'm pretty sure you, it's hard to get people to be convinced of it if the sentiment is so extreme and so aggressive. Yeah. Right. And, and I'll tell you, and, and believe me, I am, you know, I, I rant on, I rant all the time against the government and stimulus and, and the wealth gap and the, and, the, and the lack of discipline, which is really what Bitcoin arguably is trying to solve. I'm very, I, I totally get the use case and investment case. The path matters more than prediction. And no different than GameStop when a lot of people put all their money in towards, you know, what was a top in GameStop Yeah, uh, with hindsight because they all went with this YOLO mentality and, you know, there was such conviction around it and such a narrative that was so powerful. Uh, I worry, right, that you will have people doing a similar dynamic now. I, I love what you said there about why you get in determines why you leave, right? Uh, man, so true. And if you got in for libertarian values and and freedom, reasons of freedom, you know, you're going to hold tight, right? You're going to hold tight. If you got in because you've lost confidence in the fiat system, right. Right? your motivations are different. If you got in because the price is going up, completely different ballgame. And that's what I watch when that population, that third population who got in because the price is going up. We can be talking about anything, real estate, gold, Bitcoin, GameStop, doesn't matter, right? right. But when that population starts to outweigh or at least make up enough of the balance, you know, that's, yeah, okay, got it, got it, got it. So, um, so personally, Michael, you're, you invest in Bitcoin. How, how, is it in your portfolio? If so, how do you, how do you look at this asset? No, it's not, although I've traded uh, crypto assets before, right? Yeah. And I, I, and it's funny because there's an argument that, well, if you're bullish, then you should be in it. That's not true. Because the path under which, yeah, it's funny, right? A true, and I always, I always rant on this, independent of, of, of Bitcoin, uh, any investment. If you're a real investor, you want things to go down. Sure. You just, I mean, let's let's think about that for a second, right? Because time is on your side. You make more money, right? You have your job. You have more chance for getting raises. You have more income over time, right? So you have more investable spending power, right, to put into work. Which means you actually want your investments over time to go down because you have more money to buy at lower prices, to average lower. Right? Obviously, you don't want it to go down forever. You want it to at some point come back. But my point is that. You can be bullish and just simply wait for a better entry point. Now, some people will say, well, you know, it's not going to have a better entry point. Okay, you may be right. You also may be wrong, right? And, you know, listen, you know, you're an entrepreneur as well, and, and God bless everything that you've done. And I, I tell you, I, I, am, I have such respect for people that work extraordinarily hard, not just hard workers, extraordinarily hard. I have such respect for that, right? Because it takes a lot of sacrifice, right? I always use this line, you can't get the gold without the, uh, without the dragon. Right? You got you to... Gotta, fight for it, right? I'm an entrepreneur. Most of my capital is in the actual funds I run in terms of running those as business lines, yeah. right? in the ATAC rotation fund, in ATAX, in RORO, and the amount of time and energy that I spend on it. Good. You know, if Bitcoin keeps going up, great. Let it be a lesson to the policymakers that they have to fucking pay attention. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, you made a comment before we got on about... Um, <clears throat> The conversation isn't about fiat versus Bitcoin. The conversation is about fiat versus democracy. So I, I got to have you elaborate on that one. So I, I often, you know, look, a couple of things. First of all, capitalism and, and democracy coexisting is still an experiment. Now, that may be controversial, but the reality is in the grand scheme of things, this experiment of the United States, okay, has only been around for a few hundred years, not, right. not, uh, not thousands, right? So... And, and these things take a lot of time to kind of play out, right? So he, here's the way I kind of view it, right? I don't think it's a question of fiat. I think it's a question of discipline and if you can argue that you can have uh, democracy and capitalism coexist. Because let's, let's think about what that implies. How do you get elected? You get elected by promising more. But nobody's going to get elected for arguing for austerity. Yeah. Okay, so if you're going to do that, Debt's already elevated, or even if it's not, you know, why have a surplus? Because you can spend it because it's there and you get elected on that. Well, then debt only can go up and up. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's literally, it's the only way you get elected, right? So, okay, so if that's the case, that means you as an elected official have no incentive to enforce discipline because you won't be around long enough for it to actually matter because you'll get voted out, right? That's the game. So that's the game. And that's the game, not just the United States, that's everywhere. 
that is just that's human nature. I mean, it's, it's, okay. So if that's the case, it this is the bigger question, right? Can fiat coexist with with democracy? Uh, and you can argue, well, that's why there was a gold standard because it forced a degree of discipline, right? And I I completely agree with that, right? Um, in terms of some kind of a set monetary supply to kind of force you to have a budget, right? It remains to be seen. Now, the counter to that argument that uh, you can't have fiat and, and democracy as well, you know, debt doesn't matter, and that's the modern monetary theory argument, MMT. The the problem I have with the notion of MMT as a solution to this, this sort of conflict, right, between democracy and capitalism, okay, in terms of being proper steward, stewards of, of, of that capital, is it assumes uh, that there aren't nasty side effects to an ever-widening wealth gap, uh, ever-widening debt uh, base, and that side effect is the wealth gap, right? One of the things I was really ra ranting on for a while towards the latter part of last year was the notion that the U.S. government doesn't need uh, to do stimulus. The U.S. government needs to do discipline. And a lot of people took that almost offensively, like, oh, you know, people are poor, people need money. Right, people need money, not corporations. Sure. And that's where the stimulus goes. And what's happened is you've seen it. The stock market has gone vertical. Those stimulus checks are nowhere near the amount of market cap increase that's happened because of all the so-called stimulus that's been pumped into the system, benefiting just a select group of very, very wealthy individuals through their stock price. Right. So, you know, it, it, it's I don't know the answer to it. Right. But I think it, it's it's something we have to actually have a discussion around. Right. And maybe Bitcoin is the solution to that. Maybe not. But right. I think as a society, as a people, we actually have to start thinking instead of reacting. Interesting. Okay. Now, any thoughts, Michael, on the whole concept of central bank issued digital currencies? I am sure it's coming. Yeah. I am not sure it will matter. Right. Okay. Now, look, th this is this is a point which I think is 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 valid. Right. You can't stop Bitcoin because the network effect is there. Okay. Yeah. You can, however, make it a hell of a lot harder. Okay. Sure. And you don't even have to outright ban it. it you know, it, to me, it seems like it's a fairly simple way of at least aggressively slowing down adoption rate. Tax it at 90%. Sure. And some people will say, well, why, why would you ever tax? Well, we've had taxes, at, I think it was 94% in the, in the 40s or 50s. There's actual historical examples where above a certain amount of wealth, uh, assets are taxed at basically, you know, uh, the entire thing, almost the entire thing. So it, you know, it, it seems to me it's plausible you can slow it down aggressively, right? And it goes back to path versus prediction, right? If you're going to put your entire portfolio, which is a sign of conviction, well, then you better bet that that path is only going to go up, right? Because there's uncertainties in life that you're going to have to deal with along the way that you can't have conviction on in terms of when they occur, which is when you need that liquidity. And that's why the sequencing of returns matters with this, right? So I get, again, I go back to, I think it's good to have debate and, and to think through this and to properly size whether it's uh, Bitcoin, stocks, bonds, anything like that, uh, rather than just have a, an immediate reaction, which is negative, because that doesn't get anybody anything. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. Okay, Michael, look, it's been great having you on. I'm so glad we could do this. For anybody who wants to hear more and read more, because I know you produce a ton of content. You're on Twitter, super active on Twitter, but uh, you got regular videos, weekly videos, right? And you produce a lot of written content. So where, where should we send people? Yeah, no, my, my Twitter account is probably the best, uh, at Lead Lag Report, and then, of course, LeadLagReport.com. And then, again, if you happen to be interested in risk-on, risk-off strategies, I run a mutual fund, I run an ETF. I'm more than just some, some, some research guy. I'm managing money. I'm putting that capital to risk. And, again, thank you, you know, for everything that you're doing. I think you're, you're providing a lot of great content, and, and this is the kind of stuff that people need to listen to. I appreciate that. It's a ton of fun. I love it. All right. Thanks, Michael. Thank you.